I'm Pete McCall, and welcome to All About Fitness. In fitness terms, strength is the ability to generate muscular force against an external resistance. The process of strength training conditions our muscles to produce higher levels of force. Because it can help increase the size and definition of skeletal muscle, strength training is often used to improve aesthetic appearance and is a primary form of training for bodybuilding. However, when it comes to strength-based competitions like powerlifting, weightlifting, or strongman training, the focus is on strength training for performance, not appearance. Every person has a different has a different reason why you're exercising. You know, you may have a different motivation. You may exercise to improve aesthetic appearance. You may exercise to improve your health. You may exercise just because you enjoy the process of exercise. That's right. Whatever you whatever the reason is why you exercise, it doesn't matter. You're doing it for you. Personally for me, I enjoy strength training because I like being strong. When I played rugby back in my 20s and early 30s, I wanted to be stronger than my opponents. I wasn't that athletic. Anybody who played with me knows that. I wasn't really that athletic, but what I could do was be fit and know my position so I could be be an asset to, to my team on the field. So for me, strength training is a process of getting stronger. It's a process of setting goals. It's a process of challenging myself. Now that I'm in my 40s and, and my athletic career is um, way behind me, my personal fitness goals are to be strong and be fit. And yes, I want to look good, but I'm more interested in maintaining my strength and being able to physically enjoy the things that I like doing. I like enjoying life. And to me, that means every now and then enjoying meals, going out and enjoying and having food. I have two young kids. I like to have fun with them. I'm not, I'm not focused on appearance anymore. And there's something very liberating about that. But strength training is a good metaphor for life. Because you have to work hard to overcome challenges. If you work hard enough and take the right approach, you can accomplish some great things. And here's the bottom line. Some days you're going to have the strength to overcome the weight. While other days, the weight's going to get the best of you. And we've all had those days. There are days you go in the gym and you rock it. Everything's firing. Everything feels great. There are some days you go in the gym and you know what? It's not happening. On those days, you know, I, I call it quits or, you know, I, I change my program and instead of trying to lift heavy, I might do some body weight stuff. But we have to know how to do that. And that's a good metaphor for life because some days you're going to get the weight and other days the weight's going to get you. What I've found, it's not what happens to us in life, but it's how we react to it. So you have to know yourself well enough to be able to say, hey, today's not the day. Regroup, reassess, and then come back and attack on another day. And I'm talking about the weight room, but I'm also talking about other things in life. That brings me to episode 30 of All About Fitness, because I sit down and speak with strength coach Dan John about strength training and his experience. More importantly, I talk about how we can maintain high levels of strength as we get older. Dan is a strength coach and is an expert on strength training. He's almost 60 years old. In his career, he's been a, a powerlifter, a strongman competitor. He throws the discus. He throws a shot put. So he's had a career. He spans over 45 years. I mean, you hear him talk about it. You know, the the, the month I was born, he was getting ready to play high school football. So he has a lot of experience in strength training. He travels the world to teach clinics for coaches and personal trainers, and he's a frequent contributor to men's health. Now, what many people may not realize is Dan is also a professor of religious studies and philosophy. That's why I started out the intro a little bit differently today. You know, in our conversation today, we don't just talk about the physiological benefits of strength training, but we talk about the psychological benefits as well. Because if you do it right, if you have the right approach to fitness, strength training can not only give you a better body, if that's your goal, but it can help you develop a better outlook. It can give you more mental acuity. It can give you more mental focus. It can change your mindset. The most important thing is that strength training can teach you lessons that can transcend the weight room, that can transcend the athletic field, and impact all areas of your life. As you can hear, I'm pumped up, because when you talk to somebody like Dan, you realize that that strength training isn't just about our physical appearance, but it's about what exercise and what, what being fit can do for everything in our life. Sit back and enjoy episode 30 of All About Fitness with strength coach and professor of religious studies, Dan John. Skills is a sponsor of All About Fitness. 
Skills makes products for all phases of the workout, from warm-up to speed, agility, strength, and most importantly, recovery. No matter what your fitness goal, Skills has a product to meet your need. Use code PM30 for a 30% discount on your order. Skills, fitness and performance products. Be ready. www.sklz.com Vicor Fitness is the maker of the new TerraCore, which is a step, bench, balance trainer, a multifaceted exercise tool combined into one single platform. Go to vicorefitness.com to see the newest piece of equipment that will be taking the fitness industry by storm in 2017. Use the code AAF to save 20% on purchasing a TerraCore of your own. TerraCore by Vicor Fitness. Vicor Fitness. Better results from better products. Active Motion Bar is the first resistance training bar where 30% of the weight is a moving mass. An Active Motion Bar can help you strengthen your fascia and elastic connective tissue as well as your muscle, which is important for staying injury-free during the aging process. Research has found that exercising with an Active Motion Bar can be up to 170% more effective than using traditional weighted bars. Active Motion Bar, let the resistance move you. www. Dot A-C-T-I-V motionbar.com. I'm here today with Dan John. Dan, how would you describe yourself? You're a strength coach, and you know, when you work with people, like how do you describe what you do? Well, I mean, uh, so I'm a professor of religious studies for Columbia College of Missouri online, of course I invented, and then I'm a, uh, a senior lecturer for St. Mary's University in Twickenham, London, uh, in strength and conditioning. So I would say that's me. I'm this guy that uh, has a kind of a far reach in a lot of different fields. Um, I like to coach, uh, I mean, I coach American football, of course, I used to anyway, I retired from that. That's just too many hours. Um, and I still coach the the throws uh, for Westminster College here in Salt Lake. Um, so I would say, you know, I'm, I'm one of the first real strength coaches. I started in 1979 uh, at the college level. I mean, I was uh, just funny. I just did, I didn't. Even, I just was kind of swimming alongside this whole thing. I didn't didn't ever see it. I didn't think it'd be like this. I tell you that. I didn't think it'd be this big a deal. Well, I want to come back to that in a minute. But first, I'm, I'm intrigued because I've heard you talk about this before. How do you? What, what's the kind of the correlation? What's the parallel between? religious studies and i guess there's there's some philosophy baked into religious studies and mm-hmm. and your in your role as a coach and weightlifter because i kind of that's where i wanted to go with one of the questions like how is like your role how's what you've done with weightlifting how's that kind of how have you merged well, that into ph- philosophy well it's e- actually it's really quite easy theology is based on philosophy philosophy is based on geometry uh if you don't know geometry in fact it's on uh, Aristotle's school, you know, if you don't understand geometry, don't enter. Uh, <laughs> geometry is induction and deduction. Uh, it's, you know, givens, shoot, sorry. It's givens and to proves. And, um, pardon me, I don't want this thing going off the entire time. Um, and weightlifting and coaching is, what are your givens? I mean, I'm six foot. Uh, I have a lot of fast switch muscle fiber. Uh, I am, I have a lot of, I've always had a lot of personal self discipline. So those are my givens. Well, I'm not six foot eight. Well, that's, that's a wish list. My given is I'm six foot. To prove is I want to be a really good discus thrower, but going against guys who are six foot seven. Well, I can't make myself six foot seven. So what do you do? Here's your givens. Here's to prove. So the systems are very similar. Uh, in weightlifting, what are your givens? Uh, in my gym, we have uh, uh, Olympic barbells. Uh, a lot of strongman implements, Highland game stuff, lots of kettlebells, TRXs, uh, the hip thrust from Brett Contreras, um, a few other pieces and odds and ends. Well, those are our givens for equipment. Uh, I'm a master RKC uh, kettlebell instructor, so I'm pretty good at teaching kettlebells. I'm pretty good at teaching Olympic lifts. So our our givens in our weight room is that we're basically a, a, a place that you're going to do fundamental basic movements. 
well, what do you want out of it? Well, now, if you want to be, you know, I don't know, you, I'm not a great place for stroke victims. Yeah. Because okay. that's not, that's not what we're good at. But if you come, you're welcome and we'll help you any way we can. Uh, if you're, if you're uh, a high school football player, I'm not a good place to come to anymore because my clientele has shifted to, uh, you know, more people who are professionals in the field of fitness and uh, uh, older and retired people who want to just keep training with me. I've, I've shifted my clientele. So the givens and the to prove are something you always have to, to bounce back and forth when you're, when you're a, a coach and when you're in religious studies. And that's, and, and that's, cause that's a good correlation. I mean, just my, my background, my father was a Lutheran minister for a number of years and, yeah. then, he, and then he left and, and he's focused on the counseling side. So I don't want to say I was indoctrinated, but I've grown up with a very strong um, religious leaning. And so I really, you know, I, that's one of the things that I think is unique. You see a lot of people in our field get into that side of where they're getting into more spiritual, more, more understanding about spiritual, more understanding about the growth inside the spiritual, like the spiritual growth. Now, do you think that having the ability to focus as a weightlifter and an athlete, does that help you kind of in a spiritual journey, whichever journey you might be taking, whichever direction? Well, so, you know, I'm a, my background is all Western civilization. You know, it's, uh, I was in the great books programs. And so I've, since I was young, I've been reading the Iliad and the Odyssey and, you know, the Western tradition is that there is no separation of mind, body, soul, spirit. And I think, I think when you try to separate them, I think, especially with the background I'm from, that's the problems come from. So for me, the, uh, it's funny because there's a word in spiritual studies called esoterics, which comes from the root word exercises. So on the spiritual side, they exercise on the, we exercise in the weight room and, the, and on the field to play. So it is all the same. And it, but I always tell people it's, it's, a, it's a joke, but there's the three Fs, fitness, finance, and relationships. Okay? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. they're all based on the same basic truths. And if you want to become rich, and unless you, I mean, if you're born with a golden spoon in your mouth, I get that. And, or, you know, you rip off a lot of people. I understand that too. But for the rest of us, you know, becoming successful and safe in our later years of life, it's going to be the same basic rules that we would apply to to fitness. You know, Coach Mons, little and often over the long haul. Uh, that's the best way I know for fitness, finance, and relationships. Um, taking care of the fundamentals. It's true in every important area of life. So I don't. So I never see a. There's, there's no, I don't have a lot of or in my life. O R, yeah, either yeah. or, either or is the lowest level of, of theology, and it's also I think probably the lowest level of coaching. Either we win or the season is a waste. Well, that's, that's just not, you know, that's just not very good thinking. So yeah, so I don't have any issue with that at all. I'm, in fact, I, I'm, I'm very comfortable, uh, very comfortable uh, with. The fact that what I learn in one area of life, um, I talk about Sister Maria Sumta all the time. When I was in the second grade, she went to the board and she put up a, a compass and it said, pray, play, work, and rest. And she taught us in second grade that the balance of those four things is what's going to make you successful in life. If you work too much, bad things will happen to you. If you play too much, you'll be living in your mom's basement at your 40-year high school reunion. You know, if you rest too much, you know, I don't know what that would cause. <laughs> if you spend too much time alone, you'll probably not have any room for the other ones. So it's the balance. And, of course, what I've discovered in my life, um, and I always use the example, I, when I've got my – the first time, I had two full-time jobs. When, I, when Tiff said, I think we should do it, I said, okay, but we're going to buy a hot tub. Because if I'm going to work this hard, I need to rest at a much higher level. And – if I'm going to rest at a higher level, then I need you, you fall with a setting. Yeah. I, so now I see that compass as more of a spiral. And the opposite, of course, is toilet bowling, is when you start to cut back, cut back, cut back, and pretty soon there's just not very much left to you. So this past year, uh, I had, uh, I'm doing the work right now, I had 14 streams of income. Well, that's a lot of, that's a lot of companies to interact with beyond my own. 
that's a lot of people to write articles for. Well, I also looked at my schedule, and I also noticed that I had a lot of fun at a lot of events this year, had a lot of laughs. I also noticed they had plenty of time to go for long walks. I also, you, you follow my point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for me, the great lessons of Western Civ is that if you accept the fact that you're you're one, you know, you are incarnate, you're one person, mind, body, soul, and spirit, and then you start to look at it as you bounce things out and spiral them out. Okay, I've got to work harder because I'm trying to make my career better. Well, if you're going to work harder, you better be be pretty smart about how you get your sleep in. And, you know, you better you better have some smiles on your face sometimes. And you also better have a few months alone. And I just think if you can do that, I think that's when things work out pretty good, yeah. I, I don't, and the interview's over. I think that <laughs> no, um, because I think I, I think people often overlook that. And so one of the questions I have, because when I've heard you speak before, it, you know, I love the fact that you referred to Sister Marie in second grade. You also have um, talked about a strength coach you had early on, who said you basically need to press, you need to squat, you need to bench, and yeah. like three or four things. So one of the main questions I have is: Do we overcomplicate fitness? Do we make fitness? overcomplicated in in how like what are the basics that we need when it okay. comes to let's, to working out okay here, the answer is yes of course we do but here's why uh what's the best recovery tool sleep rest Think. what's the best uh liquid restorative water thank you how much money are you gonna make on that mm, probably not much nothing i'm not gonna make a single penny for what i just told you <laughs> so when when you sit down with me uh, People often almost find it frustrating because uh, in our gym and the way we do things, uh, there is no, there's no one behind the green curtain back there. There is no Oz, you know. Don't go look. There is no I am Oz. I tell you, I tell you on day one what's going to make you state champion in four years. I tell you on day one what we're going to be doing, exactly what we're going to do, and how we're going to do it. And nothing's going to. I mean, we'll come in and tweak a few things and. We'll try new movements and we'll try new combinations just to keep the brain from going, you know, nutsy. But yeah, it is this simple. It is do the fundamental human movements with appropriate reps, appropriate sets, and appropriate load. You know, and do them a lot over the next couple of years, and you'll be fine. And and come to one of the questions I had is you've done a lot of different types of strength. Um, Mm-hmm. Strength training between powerlifting, Olympic lifting, Highland Games. Do you have a favorite? I mean, is there one particular that, that you would, you know, really prefer like to, to be able to focus on? Well, you know, it's hard to ignore the uh, the uh, the Highland Games. I mean, the Olympic lifts are beautiful, and the power lifts out there, but but there is nothing like being outside and having a huge crowd and having the thing about the Highland Games is, is it does a real nice job. You have fun at Highland Games. Uh, you have a lot of fun at Highland Games. They are uh, – you have a lot of laughs. You put your life on the line in a couple of events. The caber toss is dangerous. I'm not – there's no question about it. And when you flip a caber to you know, get a 12 o'clock at noon, a perfect throw, there is an emotional feeling of, wow, that was great. That's hard to find in other places. So I would put – I love the discus the most. But for a competition, it'd be the Highland Games. And that, but that, I can, yeah. I mean, I don't mind throwing the discus by myself and just watching it go far because it is such a beautiful thing. Yeah. Well, it's funny you say that. I had a roommate in college who um, was a couple years ahead of me. But in the early '90s, we had two TVs in our apartment, and he would video himself during his discus, and he, he threw discus and put in the shot, and he would video himself. This is early '90s before I even got into any yeah. fitness at all. But he would watch video of himself and video of. Um, of a coaching tape and I grew to really appreciate throwing. I went out to him a couple of times with training and I really, I have to say, hi, honey. Uh, my kids are going to come in and say hi, but that's really where I, I look at something like the discus and I can totally see the poetic beauty in it because you're moving. It's fluid. And, and you know, if you refine tweak certain things, you can be more powerful. Is that one of the things you really enjoy about it? Well, on the discus, the other thing that really has always amazed me is that just right. It's a farthest. Okay. So, so. Keep going, keep going. Okay, so just right goes the farthest. If you try too hard, you lose it. If you, oh, if you change the tempo, they change the rhythm, you lose the movement. If you try to be, if you try to hit the throw, 
you miss the throw. It's a lot like, it really is a lot like, <laughs> I've told people it's a lot like getting into a relationship. You've got to come into it just right. If you're too aggressive, it doesn't work. If you're too laid back, it does. you just got to be just right. So for me, it's always been a great metaphor for how life should be. Uh, I find life to be a very easy thing when I go at the right tempo, the right rhythms. Here in the United States, if I drive in the right lane, you know, the right side of the road, I'm a lot safer than if I pretend I'm in England and drive on the left side of the road. You know, going with the flow tends to be a little safer most of the time. And I, So in the discus, when you go with the flow, the discus goes a lot farther. Hard and, to learn. And I think you know, you're saying that, and I think a lot of people out there, you know, this kind of comes into the theme of where I want to go today in this conversation. But I think sometimes people try too hard. And I think that kind of gives us, do you see a lot of that in, in clients and when people, when you start working with people, both, you know, as regular fitness consumers and as fitness pros, do you think we sometimes just need to kind of kick back and just let things happen? Well, I think especially for things like, see, I think that's true for fat loss. Most people want to come in and, uh, how long do we have to talk? Can I, can I explain a concept? Yeah, about 40 minutes, another 30, 40, you know, I don't want to take too much of your time. So there's a concept from uh, theology called steno intensive symbols. And steno means one meaning. It has one single meaning. And um, it used to be if you saw a clown in a movie, it had one meaning. But now you need more information. Is it a killer clown? Is it, a, you know, uh, generally, uh, I usually use the example of desk because that's the best. I always have a desk near. Uh, when I say this is my desk, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But if a beautiful woman walked by and I said to you, she is so desk, you would not understand the phrase. You would need more information. Tensive is something like the moon, the full moon at start of a movie, where you need more information to understand it. So tensive symbols, um, well, the moon is the best example. Oh, it could be a vampire movie, a werewolf. It could be a love story, right? So the problem we have when we work with most people is that the, the best example in to explain all this is the word gay. The word gay, I'm telling you, the word gay means happy, okay? The word gay means happy. The word gay means happy. After I saw your face, I was so gay. Well, see, you instantly start to smile because the word gay in 2017 has a steno meaning, okay? Mm -hmm. So you can't sing with high school kids certain songs, Don We Now or Gay Apparel. They can't sing that song anymore, okay? Yeah. yeah. Most people who listen to fitness things have a steno symbol about diet and exercise. And the steno symbol for diet is rabbit food and starvation. The steno symbol for exercise is vomit in a bucket, I'm a sweaty mess. And we are... Never, it's going to be really difficult to overcome this idea that vomit in a bucket and sweaty mess and rabbit food is the way to lose fat. It's not a good way to lose fat. In fact, most people who try that stuff find over time they end up down the line fatter than when they start. I I always tell my uh, female clients, um, take a picture the the very first day you start a diet because you'll never look that good again. You know. Uh, because of the steno symbol. So this is a long way around to my point. But if you try to take a if you try to take a baseball bat and hammer and beat your fat to submission, your body goes in a different direction. Your body actually clings to it because it's there's something bad happening and I want to live a lot longer. So for most people, if they would just kind of go for the flow. I just had a blog post this week about a buddy of mine who rolls out of bed and goes for a 45-minute walk and does 100 swings after that walk. That was his New Year's resolution to, uh, to change his life uh, last year. I sometimes wait on articles. He lost 14 pounds in January going on a 45-minute walk and doing 100 kettlebell swings. How hard is that? Neither of them are hard. But at the end of the month, 14 pounds – and the funny thing he said is it was the easiest thing he's ever done. His dog loves him because he takes the dog on the walk. He's, he looks great. And uh, and his kids like him because he's not a psychopath. You know, yeah. most people want to work. You know, they just want to go in the gym and just, just lay it all out in the line like they're some 
movie, and it's, none of it's true. And and that's what that's what that's what I, I get concerned about because I see this. I've I've worked in commercial fitness and health clubs for years, and I can't tell you how many people I see doing high intensity stuff because you have two two types of people that come into a gym, right? You have the people that that have to fight like the Dickens to get in there three times a month. And then you get the people who you can't kick out of there when the place is on fire. Literally, I've had to kick people yeah. off a treadmill when there's been a, a laundry room fire. You know, get out of here. There's a fire. No, no. I got, and I'm like, no, no. There's fire department is coming. You see that smoke? This isn't get out. You know, so we have two type of people. We have the people that, that don't know how to do what they do. And then they have people that work way too hard. And I always try to make the point that you you can't do that. Physiologically, you can't do that. And, and so a question I'm going to ask you is, What's the difference between pain and discomfort and which one, which one would be, you know, kind of is a more appropriate guide for, for how we should exercise? Well, I honestly say neither. Um, I, I'm to the point, well, you know, I had a good talk with John Duquesne yesterday and we were talking about, or two days ago, that'll be two. We were talking about, uh, he, he believes, you know, the Wim Hof method, you know, that we need some environmental distress because that seems to get certain engines kicking on our body. So, yeah, there is a need for some discomfort, I guess. But at the same time, you know, if you're working with a client who's 70 pounds overweight, walking into the gym, walking up a flight of stairs, walking around the block is also, is plenty of discomfort. And so now we're going to add more discomfort plus the fact that they – generally feel terrible that one woman famously telling me uh i'm so fat my husband won't touch me that is a quote man and i don't need to make her more uncomfortable she's she's very uncomfortable she doesn't need more of it pain's a tough one you know i mean if you want to be a great athlete you better learn to understand hurt and pain you're going to be hurt and you're going to be in pain but what I think just happened is we've just run into the to the traditional problem we have in the industry. Let's go through four words real fast. Health, according to the Maffey tone, is the optimal interplay of the human organs. So that's the pancreas, that's the liver, that's the lungs. If you don't have any blocks, you don't have any cancers, your your numbers are good on your blood profiles, you're healthy. That's the problem is in America though, we say that people who run marathons are healthy, and that's not true. Fitness is the ability to do a task. And so what we've gone, especially the CrossFit people, have gotten this idea that you prove something by doing this task, this 20 burpee thing. Okay, good for you. you. did 20 burpees. It means nothing. The inventor of the burpee, a guy named Royal Burpee, felt you only needed four of them. So I don't know why we're fighting over that. The third word is longevity. And in my definition, it, it, even more clear to me after burying my uh, cousin yesterday um, is live long and drop dead, you know, or live well and drop dead. Um, and the fourth word is performance and performance is when they put the spotlight on you and they call your name and you're asked to do something. And I think what happens in our industry is that we look at performance and then we take what performers are doing and then give it to a 75-year-old woman. Listen, I don't really care if you're in pain at the national championships. I really don't. Honestly, I don't. If you're if you're we've been building up to this for four to six years, and you have a lot of discomfort. I mean, I hate to be so crude, but I don't care. Uh, your name is about to be called. It's time to go. It's time. I know your hands are bleeding. I know that you it, a lot of your joints hurt. I know. We'll fix that the rest of your life. Today is time to go. But that is when I'm working with a performance athlete. That's when I'm working with a performer. So what happens sometimes is we is we take and we listen to what these, you know, I mean, God bless Wim Hof. I mean, God bless Wim Hof. He makes his living by diving into underneath ice and swimming in freezing water until his corneas freeze up. Okay, good for him. Now, I do learn things from him, but I don't make my living jumping into ice flows. So even though I can learn some things from him, I also have to be pretty careful. Uh, it's, you know, I use kettlebells, and sometimes I'll read it online. People will criticize me because uh, the way I teach kettlebells doesn't lend itself to, to high numbers in this thing called gear voice sport. 
And I want to take these people aside and strangle them because you are doing a sport with kettlebells. I am using kettlebells as a tool. I mean, I don't see Olympic lifters running to gyms and saying, you're all, you all should be only snatching and cleaning and jerking those. Those are barbells. It's a tool. If you want to up your bench, you don't put the bar on the floor, snatch it overhead, lay back, do a bench, overhead squat, and put it down. That would be an interesting workout, but not a good way to bench press. So I think what happens in our industry is that we, we take these concepts from here and there and there and then just try to shove them – I mean – Put them in a blender, a funnel, whatever, and and just force it down everybody's throat that it's all the same, and it's just and it's just truthfully not. Did you did you follow that? Yeah, totally. And and I think because I think that's where a lot of my concern is is you see when people get exposed to certain media images of personal trainers, when people get exposed yeah. to certain media images of what fitness is supposed to be, they think that you know you still have that thing: no pain, no gain, or pain is weakness leaving the body. And, yeah. and to your point, it, it, you know, I'm, I'm a rugby player by training. I'm a rugby player by background. You know, if, if you're playing in the 78th minute of a match, of an 80 minute match, guess what? It's going to suck. <laughs> guess what? You're it's not going to be comfortable. And and I don't want you to, you know, the kids I coach, I don't want you to quit. I need you to play 80 minutes of an 80 minute match. But if I'm working with somebody whose goal is weight loss and they haven't been in a gym in 10 years, that, that goes out the window. I want you to be comfortable and I want you to have a positive relationship with fitness. And how do you think people can develop that positive relationship? That's a huge, that's a multi-layered question, (laughs) but I mean, like, how do we reframe it? So we start looking forward to exercise. Well, that's the huge paradigm shift. I mean, that we, that we've actually, we're farther away from it than we were. Um, you know, I always go back to Art Devaney's great, the, the lady raised her hand and said, how do you lose fat? He famously said, don't lose, don't get fat in the first place. And she got all pissed off and, you know, whatever. But in a sense, you know, how do you get in shape? Don't get out of shape is a pretty good answer. But the problem we have is that this steno symbol of, you know, vomiting and rabbit food is what the, is that's what certainly middle school and high school kids hear. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Exercise is punishment. Running laps is punishment. Uh, working out is punishment. Uh, we go, you know, we're gonna we're gonna go for the burn. We're gonna hit the wall and bust through it. Every 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 phrase we use drives us down the line. So it's, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if we can totally unpack it. I'm I'm, I'm not being negative. I'm not being oh well, you know, you kids and your marijuana cigarettes and your internet. I'm just saying it's gonna be hard to unpack it. Because we have been when 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 we all decide that for, for example, there's no question about it. I have a I have a computer here and it's got a, a set of keys called QWERTY, Q W E R T Y, and that was set up because the original designers of the typewriter found that if they were in a, a better order, the they would jam the, the, the things that punched the letters on the page. So we have known since the beginning that QWERTY is a very poor design for a keyboard, for uh, American English especially. Uh, when is QWERTY going to change? Who knows? I mean, that, that, yeah. Yeah, I mean that's, it's, it's a standard on so many levels. Yeah. So, in fact, I understand there's another one. I've, I was even thinking just as, a, as for fun to learn it. You know, I've learned other things in my yeah. life. But I look at the QWERTY. I don't. This is the. the, the I was looking for an example. And this yeah. was perfect. So I'm looking at the QWERTY uh, keyboard here, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, we everybody knows it's an inefficient way to type the letters. And we all know it, and we don't change it. We don't come in and change it. We all know that Fahrenheit and miles and all that. Uh, President Nixon wanted to change it in '72 and '73. We know it's an outdated system. We're never changing it. So if we can't change things that are as obvious as QWERTY and Fahrenheit, how are we going to change things like, you know, exercise? They're just going to, you know, the, we're, we're cutting PE courses back. We're cutting, you know, music back. Music and – it's funny because the, uh, the Greeks believed that music and gymnastics were the foundations of education. 
Yeah, I mean, you get the rhythm and you get the rhythm for the music and there's a certain yeah. flow in movement in gymnastics, in gymnastics yeah. is body weight training. And and I think that, that that's one of the reasons, Dan, why I'm trying to do this podcast is because being an educator in the fitness industry, I'm exposed to so many people like yourself and, and other folks out there that are, you're delivering this message. But the trainers you see, even, you know, you do a number of workshops, you work with Perform Better, you're seeing maybe, maybe 1,500, maybe 2,000 or so, give or take, a year. Now, granted, yeah. of those people that see you speak, maybe maybe a few people just kind of tune out because you say one thing. So you're getting the, the point is you're getting the message out there. We're getting there are people out there that are trying to carry that message out there. And that's what I'm trying to do with this podcast is get people who are listening. You don't need to kill yourself in order to get in shape. You don't need to kill yourself in order to be healthy. And it's a cool thing, Pete, is I'll go to a gym and they'll say, like, if you're ever here, come visit our gym. I'll go and visit my gym. And these will be people. And I'll look around and I'll see on the walls and they will have implemented my work. And I watch the training and it's like you're you're doing what – it's a weird thing to see the inside of your brain yeah, yeah. on by somebody else's hand. It's pretty cool actually, yeah. So there are some places you can go that, you know, that – you know, focus on reasonable workouts and I'm very proud. I mean, uh, there's, there's a lot of them. Uh, I would say, well, there's a, I mean, there's a lot, but, um, my favorite one would be Mark Fisher fitness there in New York. You know, even though they do a lot of different things, their program programming and planning is rock solid, basic, solid stuff, smartly done. Yeah. Well, and, and, and we go down the thread. So one of the, one of the things, uh, like I mentioned before the start of this, is I'm really trying to get over, um, trying to communicate the benefits of, of fitness to the over 40 crowd. How has fitness changed? I mean, you mentioned that you're, you're a few years beyond 40. How, how have you changed your workout programs, and how should we change our workout programs as we get 40 and beyond? Can we, number one, can we still work out? Can we just still do strength training and power training? But how do we adjust to accommodate yeah. for the change in physiology? It's there's a couple things. First, so I have what I call the six fundamental human movements. Okay, push, pull, hinge, squat, loaded carry, and then everything else. So when you're young and you're an athlete, you would focus on the hinge and the loaded carry. The the hinge are the deadlifts, the Olympic lifts, uh, the big, the most powerful thing you can do as human. And the loaded carries are farmer walks and prowlers and sleds. The hinge builds. Explosion and the loaded carries build work capacity. Now, hold on. There's three other movements, the push, pull, and the squat. And those are what I call those the sex drive movements. Those are the ones that build hypertrophy, some some, some obvious power too. But mostly they're, they're your bodybuilding movements. And then there's the sixth movement, which is everything else, which I include crawling and hanging from bars and monkey bars and – Everything, rolling, everything you think of. So what I tell people is after probably, and you want me to start with 35? Is yeah, okay? 35, yeah, 35 is perfect. Sure. Yeah. Once you're at 35, a, an amazing thing happens. You just get fat walking down the street for no reason at all. <laughs> um, so up to age 35, you can get away with just about everything. But after 35, you really need to start, you need to actually train like a bodybuilder. And when I tell people push, pull, and squat, I mean that the reps are all the exact same. So I believe you should do about 15 to 25 solid reps in a workout for hypertrophy. Slide it up to 30, but 15 to 25, that's five sets of five, three sets of eight. So if you're doing a push, three sets of eight. You're doing a pull, three sets of eight. Doing a squat, three sets of eight. That's not a bad workout. (laughs) And if you have some variation of that, you could probably do well a long time. But the other factor at from about 35 to 55 that's important is the survival stuff. That's when you should be taking – if you don't know how to roll, take a fall, um, geez, uh, CPR, Heimlich maneuver, uh, take a safe driving class, learn a uh, garden. You know, That's the time of life. After 35, you need to make sure you pick up your skill set in a lot of different areas besides just benching you – know, bench and curl after 55 survival slides at the very top um i didn't know this until reading this yesterday but diseases like parkinson's come on from uh sometimes an acute injury that Mm. kicks everything off i know statistically at my age it's better to have cancer than is to fall and break a joint 
statistically uh, for, for longevity. So after 55, you are now <laughs> – you're now cashing the checks you've been writing for the past 55 years. So if you have joint issues, back issues, neck issues, if you did something stupid at 55, you are, you are really climbing a mountain to undo that. Um, if you didn't ever save any money for your retirement, trying to fix that at 55 is really difficult. I retired in 2010 and that because I had done the little things in the early, early 1980s that set me up. Um, so fitness, finance, relationships all really come to a head at about 55. The, the deeper entrenched you are in community, the better your life is going to be after 55. So at 55, survival, uh, which is the sixth movement, kind of slides to the top of the heap. After 55, the sex drive moves, push, pull, and squat. Those are the ones that will continue to make that hormonal cascade go. So when you're training somebody, say 35, let's just say blankly, 35 and above, you would you would kind of look at it this way. You kind of say survival movements first. Teach them the when's the last time you've been on the ground. You know, when's the last time you rolled around? Do, can you hang from a bar for 30 seconds? That's one of my standard standards. If you can't hang from a bar for 30 seconds, we're not going to get cute about anything else. That is such a minimum, but we got to have you at that minimum. Um. From there, after 35, then I look at hypertrophy again. Um, that would be making sure you're getting your, your, your push, pull, and squat movements in. And if you got that knocked down, then I'd have you increase your work capacity with some uh, loaded carries, the farmer walk family, pulling some sleds, things like that. And then from there, of course, let's see if we can get that deadlift movement, the hinge back. Let's wake that butt up. Uh, the butt is the symbol of youth. So if I can get your your rear end <laughs> engaged, good things tend to happen. Um, the rounder and taller that butt is, the, the younger you seem to be. So um, I'm, it's funny because, you know, uh, Paul Anderson used, used to talk about the guy, the, big, the guy with the biggest butt lifts the biggest weights. And um, there's a sex in the city about a saggy butt. But we all know that, that the stronger the butt is, the healthier the engine is. So that's how I would tell you to train. I, it, I, it might some of your listeners might be saying, "Well, that was vague." It wasn't vague at all. Learn how to fall. Learn how to monkey bar. You know, move around. Do do three sets of eight, three sets of five, five sets of five, in some push pull squat. Uh, pick up a pair of uh, dumbbells and go for a walk. Go for a walk. Go for a walk. Go for a walk. And then from there, try to get some of that uh, explosion back in you. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. It's, it's funny, Dan, because I did, and you, you don't know this, I mean, we don't know each other that well at all, but this past year I did a whole um, series of conference sessions on training from the ground up, like ground to standing exercises, yeah. and kind of other ground to standing sequences besides the Turkish yeah. get up for that specific purpose because we don't, because it's going back to watching my young daughters learn how to crawl. I, you know, I follow, I, I studied under, I, I did Gary Gray's uh, mentorship for a year. So sure. from, from Gary, I kind of learned that if we want to understand muscle function, we have to understand what a muscle does when we walk. So what I do in that session is I go back and revert back to crawling, rolling patterns to default, to reset the system, to reboot the yeah. system. If you will, it's like a hard, it's like a reboot on your computer. Yeah. What's yeah. the first thing you do? What's the first thing the, the help desk tells you when you call up the help desk? Turn it off. Turn it off. And so I tell people, it's like if you get on the floor and roll a little bit, you go back to your instinctive pattern of when you learned how to crawl. And the, 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 the movements you, you talked about, squat, push, pull, rotation, carry, they're all inherent in how we learn how to walk and how to crawl and walk. And, 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 and you know, kind of, I mean, you, I've, I've listened to you, Gray, and so many people speak for so many years that, and I've studied this stuff going, going through the own, through, on my own. That that's what people don't realize is sometimes you got to make take what we do and make it just just go back to what your body wants to do, and, and it, your body wants to move. And sometimes I think we overcomplicate that. We overcomplicate it every single day of the week. Yeah, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and and the other thing with with, with getting older is um, I try to encourage older adults, you know, fifty five and above, to lift heavy weights. Not start there, but look at. Can, oh. Can you lift heavy weights and can we do some explosive training? And again, yeah. this is all relative. It doesn't mean start. Yeah. I would never give a 16 year old kid the keys to a Porsche Carrera because they'd kill themselves. But you always, you know, it's getting them thinking about 
it is perfectly safe to do strength training and do power training, but we have to prepare you for it. I always say load is last. Yeah. The movement is first. The load is last. Um, it's interesting because, um, people come into the gym far stronger than the, the weight on the bar. They don't know it. They just, they don't know how strong they can be. Um, it's, it's a hard one because uh, it's opposite thinking to those of us who've been in the weight room. I started lifting weights in 1965. So um, for me, when, I, when people think a weight is heavy, I want, just want to say, well, trust me, when you carry the groceries in, the groceries or your grandkids are heavier than most of the stuff you're training with. But load, even saying that, load is the least important of the things we do. Well, and I think well, that – and I try to point out to people is that – it's funny because you see this dichotomy. To use an example from sports, you see college football coaches try to get their players as big and strong as possible. I mean mm-hmm. they, make the, they make strength training a huge component. <laughs> but then what happens when they get to the NFL? You know, the size kind of plays a second role to mobility and speed. Is that, is that correct? I would say there's a lot of truth in that. And then, and so now it's like you try to get people to understand that. And the big trend, I mean, you started out with this earlier, is if people are exercising, especially if they're over 50, what should they be doing after they exercise? You know, what's kind of the post exercise? What should they be paying attention to once they walk out of the gym? Do you want our system? Yeah, yeah. Oh, sure. So our system is, <laughs> we call it the three E's. Uh, so. <laughs> So we like our people to come in fasted when they train. So we, we work out in the morning, uh, this for the adults. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And we call it uh, the three E's are eliminate exercise, eat. So, um, we like the most important, the most important part of your training is your sleep ritual. So we recommend you supplement up, uh, how, how de- detailed do you want on this? This is, I mean, honestly, this is, this is a common theme. And so I think to hear, however people hear it, I think it's sure. awesome. I mean, as deep, much detail as you well, want to go into. Sure. You should probably buy yourself a set of blue blocking uh, glasses and start wearing them probably about 8 o'clock or 7. Um, so they're amazing. About an hour before you go to bed, if you can, turn off the television, turn off the computer, if you can. I know it's tough. Yeah, uh, I'm a big believer in a hot tub. Uh, we have a hot tub uh, before you go to bed and an ice shower if you can do that too. Um, about an hour before you go to bed, that's when you take, you should take your vitamin D. Um, I like this stuff called calm. It's just a magnesium drink that Rob Wolf recommended to me. Um, any, any supplements that you think have value, any medicines that you might need to take, take them about an hour. And if you, I'll tell you one thing, calm is better than scotch for relaxing. It's, <laughs> it's, yeah. Now, if you take too much, you'll, you'll know in the morning, uh, the most important thing you do is sleep. Um, it's funny to watch the research slide back up from the magic hour, eight hours up to nine again, is that you should be in nine hours of sleep. Um, I find that just fascinating because one of the commitments, my wife and I both had some uh, physical issues this year. Mm-hmm. And we went, I took her to, as a kind of a way to undo some of it. I took her on a date to Ireland for a month. So, so we spent a month in Galway. And one of our goals was to sleep until we were awake. It didn't, we didn't care what time we went to bed. We didn't care, care what time we got up. And we both noticed with – and then, of course, we walked to the Galway Bay, which is colder than the Arctic, yeah. and swim every day. And what we noticed within about two weeks is that our skin looked better. Our smiles were happier. We were just sleeping nine hours a day and, and taking a cold, a cold one. So the elim- now the morning starts off with, with eliminate, but you'll notice I talked about eliminate already. Yeah, eliminate crap TV, eliminate <laughs> crap relationships, eliminate stressors in your life you can eliminate. Uh, here's a quick one. It's so simple, but uh, I have that Amazon Prime thing. If there is a TV show that we watch, we just buy the season. Yeah, and we watch it the next day in 22 minutes instead of the 30 minutes of. So if you're going to watch TV, be a big kid, spend the extra money. Eliminate the commercials. Uh, eliminate the stressors in your life. It could be people. It could be situations. I tell you, if you can walk to work, your life simplifies. In the morning, eliminate also would, would be your uh, your digestive and your systems and your elimination systems. But one of the things we talk about a lot, if if 
you start your day with eliminating cluttering, clutter and you have your physical eliminations, uh, then the next thing we ask you to do is exercise. And the exercises we tend to, right now, we're doing three days a week of mobility and upper body hypertrophy and two days a week of um, basically uh, kettlebell ballistics followed by loaded carries. And the idea on that is that most of us in our group are, um, you know, we're that 35 to plus age group and we need to do what we said earlier. So after you eat, then we go uh, after you. So eliminate exercise, eat. And we, we always go out to breakfast together at the same place. We talk to everybody we can and, uh, we all emphasize eating at that meal eight different vegetables. So I'll generally have the vegetal, uh, the, the veggie omelet with a Greek salad. So the goal is here it is uh, 10 in the morning, and I've already had eight different vegetables and protein. So I can make some mistakes after that. So that's our system. Well, and that's and that's one of the things I think your message is so powerful with Dan is that it's very you know you're not overcomplicated. You're very basic. And, you know, it's, it's, it's stuff that works and it's stuff that you've, you've used as an athlete and that you've used as a coach. Now, real quick, just one or two more questions and I'll let you go. And, and I have my little one here. I want, she wants to be a part of this conversation as well. Um, the funny thing is, is my wife kind of freaks out by let them pick up my kettlebells in the garage. If they can pick them up, I let them pick them up and carry them because I'm not going to tell them not to. If they drop them on their feet, guess what? They're not going to drop them on their feet again. Ever, ever again. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was only going to take one time. And, and it, if they can't pick it up, they don't pick it up. And, and I'm fine with them picking that up. But of, of the equipment that you, you've mentioned, your know, barbells, kettlebells, do you have like uh, what would be your go to equipment? If I'm just looking to get some stuff for at home and I don't have much space, what would you be, be your go to equipment and, and, and why? Oh, sure. For If you only had one piece of equipment for a male, I'd say the 20 kilo kettlebell. For the female, probably the 10. Yeah. Uh, yeah. From there, I would probably slide up to a TRX. Um, from there, I would probably play around with another kettlebell, uh, maybe go to double 20s or maybe go to a heavier bell, depending on what you're, what you're looking for. Um, you go to a place called Ross Dress for Less and buy a $5 ab wheel. Um, which are just phenomenal piece of equipment. Isn't it funny how they've come back? I remember my parents had one when I was like eight in the in the early eighties, you know. And now they seem to be ubiquitous in, in training facilities. But if you have a twenty k kettlebell, uh, or even make up your own strap system for free, uh, and a, and an ab wheel, you really you can get it all done right there. Those that's pretty good three pieces of equipment. Now, having said that, if you bought an Olympic barbell. Back in 1954, that's probably still perfect. Yeah, but it just you know, it, it just depends on what you have. You know, I've been down to in my married life just a single kettlebell, a 28k. Uh, one time, I only had 165 pounds of total weight to train with, and I went to the uh, Olympic trials with that. So I mean, you know, it wasn't too bad. Uh, you know, so we you just uh, uh, American Open, American Open that. Uh, so you just, you know, it's, it's not so much, I mean, I've got this piece behind me. It's a $1,300 rower and it sits down here in my office because it's just a, it's just, a, that's the worst investment I ever made. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I, I, and know, I, like, I, I like row, sorry about that. I like rowing machines, but you're right. If you don't use it, that it's, it's, it's yeah. there. I mean, I have 22 kettlebells and, you know, two Olympic bars and all that was cheaper than one little you know, cardio machine. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what people, yeah, that's what people don't realize. And then you said this early on, I'm going to come back to something you, you, you touched on um, real quick before we get out of here, but you started being a strength coach. You started getting in strength coaching in the late seventies. And I think what people are surprised and, and, and people always seem shocked when I mention this, but high school kids today are doing more advanced programs than professional athletes did in the late seventies and eighties. Would you agree with that? Like a high school kid going to like oh, one. There's, no, there's no question about that. I mean, I mean I'll, I'll get these emails from these school pro. But the problem, okay, let's just do it. I talk to this. This comes up all the time. And if I'm throwing people under the uh, what do they call it, the, under the bus, I'm sorry. But you know, when I was at Utah State, I threw a discus 190, and my weightlifting program was three days a week, and I snatched and cleaned, and that was the whole program. 
and I might have done a little bit of fun work, you know, you know, but really that was it. Now these poor kids go in and they've got 20 dynamic mobility exercises. They got, they got mini, uh, they got mini bands. They got plyometrics. They've got yeah. all these, you know, arm things, L thing, R. They've got tempo on there, and they throw the discus 30 and 40 feet less than I did. And I, I'm not being a jerk, but it's like you, you guys are doing more, but is more better. It's quality. I mean, what, what's the quality of it? And, you know, but I think people are surprised when, you know, the, the conditioning, the strength and conditioning commercial fitness industry is still relatively young. I mean, we're still, I, I kind of equate us to, because yeah. between, between us and Silicon Valley, I mean, we both, you know, Silicon Valley started in the mid set, early mid seventies and has, has blossomed and, and fitness and conditioning has kind of, we're, we fall on a similar trajectory, but at a much, much lower rate. <laughs> You you would think that because what you you probably missed was the Nautilus bump and not Arnold. So Arnold comes out with the education of a bodybuilder in seventy five, and Nautilus shows up probably full force seventy one, seventy two, seventy three. So up until then, we had a pretty good. It was pretty good. Yeah, you had strength and health, which I have every copy. You know, this, I was just like, while I was waiting for you, I was going through some back issues for my next yeah. book. Um, you know, there was bar, there was a feature well, right right here, barbells on campus, University of Massachusetts. That was a standard thing. The program was not bad. Some of the schools, some of the small Catholic schools back east, developed monster track and field programs by having strength programs that you look at now and go, that was brilliant. But what happened with Jones when he shows up with Nautilus and then Arnold is that it's the the rise of the machines and Frankenstein training with Arnold arm day, leg day, calf day, traps day, you know? And so what happened is it's not that we started it. What happened is we just got, we got lost a whole, not, not generation, but we probably lost 15 years of traditional strength training to bodybuilding and machine work. And the funny thing is guys looked good. I remember that I'd go to, I'd go to track meets and I'd be like, Damn, what's wrong with me? I mean, and you, they get in the ring and they throw 181 or you know 172, looking like I mean they should crush the implement, but they were they were 25 different pieces, not one piece. So and, I don't disagree with your point, but you just got to remember that we lost. Now here's the thing: Can you make a lot of money selling Nautilus machines? Oh yeah, I do. I'm a, I'm a consultant for in, in full disclosure. I've done some consulting with Nautilus uh, recently, so. Yeah, twenty five thousand dollars machine, right? Hey, Joe, you know. <laughs> it's a fair amount of money. Yeah, how much? Do I, how much do I make when I tell you to take more sleep? You know, yeah, that, that, uh, it comes back to your original point. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. So you know, and again, I'm not. I think Arnold did a lot of good for for some things, and I'm sure. And you know, actually, Jones actually brought up a lot of good points, but none of it. And I said this, and I said this to people all the time: if it was so good, prove it in track and field. The metrics aren't there. If all you're doing is training on machines, you are not going to improve performance on the field. Yeah, and I'll track and or I'll even allow swimming because those are you know, yeah, you might look better. You have know, pecs and you know, all that stuff and you know, whatever it is. But uh, yeah, so sorry. That, I hope I didn't get too far off your question there. I apologize. No, and, and just <laughs> it's funny how you keep hitting on this, but uh, that was my first book, uh, Arnold: Education of a Bodybuilder. I think I got it in '83 or '84. And I sometimes start my talks, Dan, especially when I talk about like um, understanding anatomy and understanding movement, is I put a picture of that book up on a slide and said, okay, this is what we thought, or kind of do that Mike Boyle approach and say, we were, we, we were incorrect. If all you're going to do is walk on a stage in your underwear, this is the way you need to train. But if you're looking to improve performance, improve movement, and change just how people feel, we yeah. need to come at it from a different way. We need to come at it from lift something, carry something, throw something, go that route. And so it takes us right back to that original thing on performance versus fitness. Ar you know, Arnold was in two weight, he was in a weightlifting meet, snatched 242 and clean and jerk through 303 or 308, which is just fine. But at 242, that's not very good at all. 
Yeah, no, he's not. That's not that much power. Now, mm-hmm. if people want to get more information, um, I know you have a few books out there. What's your What's your most recent book, and what the What do you cover with that? What topics do you cover? Yeah, before we go, I have two books that are comp- compilations. Uh, Never Let Go and Before We Go. And then I've got two books coming out very soon. i got one called Now What? It's about performance. Okay. That's coming out. That's in its final edits. Um, but uh, danjohn.net is where you'll find most of my stuff. But you can buy – You can buy. yeah, go to danjohn.net. That's your that's your best place. And that's got – that that'll hi- – hyperlinks to the publisher page. You can buy my books on Amazon. But if you buy them from On Target Publishing, my publisher – um, they, Larie Draper, Dave Draper, if you know who Dave is, okay, you, okay. Uh, she always puts, if you buy the book, you get like an MP3 and a this and a that. And so you, you get more for your money at OTP. Okay. They, so I'll, I'll put a link to your webpage and I'll put a link to on target. I met yeah. Larie a number of years ago when I worked at the American council right. on exercise and, um, right. to be able to do that. Yeah, no, Dan, I appreciate your time, man. I really appreciate well, it. I, I love your message of of doing the basic things right. Of, of, if all we remember to do is, is the basic things. Yeah. Well, throw the discus and lift weights. It's a pretty good thing to throw a discus bar. You know. Are you still competing in the discus? Are you still doing any? Uh, yeah, I'm coming out of retirement this year. Yes, I am. I uh, had a lot of. I had a number of surgeries. I had to take care of a hernia, take care of a leg. So. Um, uh, and, um, and also too, you know, once I started getting into masters competition, um, God bless them, but they start to get a little bit, uh, I don't know how well you know scripture, but they become a little bit like the Pharisees. They, they get to a little bit to the, the letter of the law and things yeah. and you go to a meet and they were complain because the 27. 0.4 kilo weight was 27.5 and it was a D handle, not a C handle. And the, the 42 degrees was, that's like, guys, man, these, that guy over there is 75 years old. He doesn't need it. Just get, let him get in the ring, you know? Yeah. And it was a little, some of the, I've been to really, really high level open track meets at the nationals and stuff where the, where they were less ticky tack about the rules. Uh, and that was hard for me. Yeah, because it's like the joy of the sport was lost, you know, um, and just sometimes when you're sitting there for, you know, go to a track, a three day track, meet, just kind of gets expensive. We have kids in college, you know. Yeah, you know? it does take a thing. I, hey, I turned 45 this year. And the one thing I'm really, the, the main thing I'm looking forward to is now I'm eligible for 45 and over rugby. So rugby has 35 to 44, then 45. What's your, what's your birthday? Uh, August. August. What day? August 5th. What year? 72. Let's get ready for uh, sophomore football. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but that's, and that's what I love. Every time I see you speak, it's just, you come back, but you, to sophomore football, you probably still use some form of that basic program today, 45 years <laughs> later, correct? No question about it. Yeah. In fact, uh, you were also born during the Munich Olympics. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I think, uh, yeah, during, during the, I mean, that was a very interesting time. And, and that's what, so when I came up, my first introduction into fitness was Arnold was Stallone was, you know, the eighties, everybody yeah. wants the big muscles cause you win the fight and get the girl. Well, you know, and if it is last point, I think the Hollywood montage, you know, that montage thing from yeah. Roxy and you know, where the white guy high fives, the black guy, and they yeah, get yeah. Rid of racism and, then they high five the girl and we get rid of sexism. Yeah, I think it's been one of the biggest problems we've had in sports. I, I actually mean that. Yeah. I'm serious. Yeah. Many of my athletes come in with this idea that uh, we're going to have a problem and then we're going to do some stadium steps and then drink a sugar a sugar drink with some salt in it, high five each self, and then we go win. And that's just not that montage is it. Is they they over they've overdone it a little bit. I'll just say that. <laughs> Dan, thanks for your time, man. I really appreciate it, <laughs> and I, I look forward to uh, speaking with you again soon. Maybe you thought it was going to be a couple meatheads talking about picking up weights, but as you can see, Dan and I got into some interesting areas of conversation. And when you look at somebody that, that spent their career weightlifting and you, who also combines that with a career of teaching religious studies and gives you a different outlook on life. And I think that's very important because it can be very easy to look at the fitness arena and be very easy to look at, at people who work in fitness and kind of pigeonhole them 
into this kind of narcissistic meathead kind of category. I, that I know that's happened to me, and I know that happens with a lot of my colleagues. But in reality, it takes a lot in order to do good programming, in order to really understand how exercise impacts the body and how we can use exercise to change physiology in the body. You really have to have a deep understanding of what you're doing. That's why people like Dan are such a resource and such a benefit for our industry because they don't just bring in the knowledge of what it takes to get stronger, but they bring in the psychology that goes along with it because being good, being a high performer, no matter what you do, no matter what you do in your daily life, being a high performer isn't just about having a physical ability, but it's about having the mental ability. It's about having the focus, the drive. And I get into this with some of some of the other people I interview, and you'll hear this in other episodes of the podcast, that, that the physical performance is one thing, but what separates people, what separates the, the, the top percent, you know, the top percentiles, the top of the pyramid, is that mental focus, that acuity, that drive, that determination, that intelligence. So, you know, some people call it emotional intelligence, that ability to see everything and be able to, to contextualize where we fit and what we do. So hopefully you got a lot out of the conversation today. Hopefully that helped you, you know, not only understand a little bit more about strength training, but but to realize how strength training can help improve, you know, help improve everything, not just in the gym, but outside the gym as well. If you have any suggestions for people to listen to or anybody you'd like to hear me interview, please reach out to me. My email is Pete at PeteMcCallFitness.com. You can find me on Twitter at PeteMC underscore fitness. You can find me on Instagram at Pete McCall underscore fitness. And uh, as always, if you get a chance, if you have an opportunity, if you've listened up to this point, I certainly would appreciate your taking the time to give us a rating on either Google Play or iTunes because the better ratings we have, it, it bumps us up higher in the search engine and it helps everybody. It helps more people hear the message. It helps my sponsors and it will just uh, you know help me kind of carry this message to other people. So with that, thank you for tuning in to episode 30 of All About Fitness. Have fun, stay fit, and we'll talk again soon.